Questions to the Secretary of State for Scotland, Mr Stephen Kerr. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Question number one, Mr Speaker. Minister Mel Stride. Uh, my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Scotland, has regular discussions, Mr Speaker, with fellow Cabinet Ministers regarding all matters that are of, in, are of importance to Scotland. Stephen Kerr. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm grateful to the, my right honourable friend for that answer, but would he agree with me that the direct engagement, direct engagement by the UK government departments, such as Bayes and the Treasury, in growth deals, such as the Stirling and Clapmanninsur city region deal, is the best way to ensure that all economic objectives are met. Can I uh, reassure my honourable friend that uh, discussions are held right across Whitehall departments, including those that he has referred to, to make sure that these city deal projects are as successful as possible, including the Stirling and Clapmanninshire uh, city deal. And can I also recognise, Mr Speaker, the extraordinary amount of work and effort and drive that he has personally put into making sure that we help to uh, ensure that these are a success. Rear Murray. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Secretary of State and I had a conversation in the tea room on Monday, but given he's not answering this question, I'll have to ask something else. So, Brexit is obviously the biggest issue with regards to the impact on the Scottish economy. So, can the Minister tell us how much the Scottish economy will shrink by uh, if Theresa May's, the Prime Minister's deal, uh, uh, sorry, is uh, passed in this House? Well, Mr Speaker, the, uh, analysis, uh, the cross-government uh, analysis that the Government has already come forward with shows, as the Honourable Gentleman will know, that on the basis that we are leaving the European Union, by far the best outcome is to support the Prime Minister's deal. Mr Alan Brown. Thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, under the Conservative Government, the Scottish budget has been cut by £2.6 billion in real terms over 10 years, and yet the confidence supply deal the DUP means that the Barnet form has been broken to the tune of uh, £3.4 billion. When is Scotland going to get that money? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mr. Speaker, the, the, the Barnet uh, formula has uh, been honoured, and as the Honourable Gentleman will know, there are Barnet consequentials where money is are allocated to devolve matters within England, and that is not the case, for example, in the recent additional amounts to support the Northern Ireland uh, budget. And it is also the case that in the uh, autumn budget just gone, the Chancellor was able to announce changes that resulted in an additional £950 million for the Scottish uh, Government. Uh, Mr Carmichael. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The economy of rural Scotland would suffer serious damage if the Government's proposals for tariffs and foodstuff were ever to be implemented. The National Farmers Union of Scotland has called for that to be rethought. Is the Government listening to them? Well, the Government is most certainly uh, listening to all those who have concerns about the uh, introduction of uh, tariffs where they are not uh, in existence at the moment, as between ourselves uh, and the EU27, which is once again why the deal that is uh, before the House, the deal that has been negotiated with the European Union, is so important, because that would mean that we wouldn't run into those particular difficulties. Thank you. Laird. Take a few. Mr Speaker, this question is specifically to the Secretary of State for Scotland. The Secretary of State for Scotland has three responsibilities – strengthening and sustaining the Union, acting as Scotland's voice in Whitehall, and championing the UK Government in Scotland. Which one does he think he is doing best, and why? Well, I have no hesitation, uh, Mr Speaker, in answering on behalf of my right honourable friend, bound as I am to bound as I am to, given the fact that uh, I started this series of questions, and convention dictates that I therefore uh, have to reply on my right honourable friend's uh, behalf. They are all absolute priorities for my right honourable friend, and he will continue to stand up for the people of Scotland. Here, here. Laird. Right. Mr Speaker, I have to express, I think, uh, this side of the House's disappointment that repeatedly we are seeing that the Secretary of State for Scotland is actually not standing up and being accountable to to the bench. So this question, once again, is directly to the Secretary of State for Scotland, because it is he who holds the office, not the honourable gentleman sitting next to him. I am afraid I have to tell the Secretary of State that I disagree with that response. His record is abysmal. He has failed on the Stronger Towns Fund. He has failed on Brexit funding for Scotland's businesses. He has failed to stand up for Scotland's shipbuilding communities through his non-action on the Fleet Solid Support Ships contract. And he has failed to respect the devolution settlement. 
Mr Speaker, he has even failed to follow through on his own resignation threats. Secretary of State, how bad does it need to get under this Tory government for the people of Scotland before you do the right thing and actually resign? Minister. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, I, I categorically do not accept the points that the uh, Honourable Lady uh, has made. My right honourable friend uh, indeed stands up for Scotland, which is partly why which is partly well the reason why he's not at the dispatch box, as the Honourable Lady well knows, is to do with the way in which the conventions of the House operate in the respect of the answering of these questions, and she knows that. And I think it's a little unfair of her, if I may say, Mr Speaker, to try and seek to make political capital out of this particular procedural element of what's happening. But can I say that my right honourable friend has stood up for Scotland to the extent that there was £950 million additional budget for Scotland as a consequence of the last autumn budget, and £1.3 billion, Mr Speaker, going into city growth deals across Scotland. That is to support Scotland, the economy and the Scottish people. Joe Swinson. Question number two, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, sir. Mr. Speaker, I have regular discussions with my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State, for exiting the European Union. The best way to ensure that public services in Scotland and across the rest of the UK are protected is to ensure that we leave the EU with a deal. Joe Swinson. Can I share with the Secretary of State an email from one of my constituents, Ian? He says, as a doctor, I have already seen the adverse impact of Brexit on the NHS. Staff shortages are already hurting us. We cannot have Brexit and give the NHS resources it so badly needs. I know which people in our local... I know which people in our local community would prefer. Which does he think the people of Scotland would prefer? Decently funded NHS or Brexit? Mr Speaker, I think everybody in Scotland wants to see a decently funded and supported NHS. I disagree with the Honourable Lady on Brexit. Her position uh, is well known. But if we want to encourage doctors like Ian to come to Scotland, what we shouldn't be doing is taxing them £1,900 more than they would pay in the rest of the UK. Thank you, um, Mr Speaker. Isn't it the case that what we've just heard is a complete scare story? The government is making millions more extra available for the health service, and all EU nationals who are currently here are welcome to stay. And surely in the future, what we're going to be able to have is an immigration system that treats people equally regardless of where they come from in the world. Yeah, yeah, to stay. Mr Speaker, I, I agree with the points that my uh, honourable friend makes, and in the future we have to make uh, Scotland an attractive uh, place to come to. And if we want particularly doctors and senior uh, uh, health service professionals to come to Scotland, we shouldn't be taxing them significantly more than they would be paying in other parts of the UK. Marion Fellow. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The number of EU nurses applying to work in the UK has fallen by... 87 per cent, and more than 7,000 nurses and midwives from the EEA have left the UK since the EU referendum. Can the Secretary of State say with any honesty that his government's pursuit of Brexit and its hostile immigration policy hasn't seriously harmed the NHS? I can absolutely uh, say that, because this uh, government uh, is uh, committed, as it has demonstrated across the the UK for which it is responsible, uh, to the additional funding of the NHS, and we have set out uh, a proposed immigration, uh, in an immigration uh, white paper, a route for engagement as to how we ensure sure that going forward that we have EU and other citizens in our country to support the NHS and other services. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, it's nice to get a chance to actually shadow the Secretary of State instead of myriad other departments that turn up from week to week, it's particularly as his own government analysis shows that their plan for Brexit will result in a 4% drop in gross domestic product. And if his party's track record tells us anything, they will choose to impose austerity and poverty pay on public services and workers to make up for that decline. One of the worst consequences of that austerity is rising food insecurity, resulting in food bank use rising faster in Scotland than across the rest of the UK. So given the pressure this a failed austerity agenda is putting on our public services, can I ask the Secretary of State how many food banks are currently operational in Scotland, and does he predict that this number will go up or down under his current policies in this government? Well, Mr. Mr Speaker, I thought the Honourable Gentleman might have begun with an apology for his shameful remarks 
when he said that people who didn't di agree with him uh, in the Labour Party, their leaving was necessary cleansing. I don't know if members on the Labour benches are aware of those comments, but I believe they are truly shameful. Of course, in relation to food banks, everybody uh, regrets the need that people have in emergency situations to use uh, food banks. But we are clear that the support that we are providing uh, to people as we leave uh, the EU will be sufficient to meet their needs. Pete Wishart. Number three, Mr Speaker. Nay. Mr say. Speaker, with permission, I will answer questions three, four, six, eight, nine and fifteen uh, together. I recently chaired the Joint uh, Scottish Business Growth Group and regularly meet with the Scottish Government in a number of other forums, including the JMC, to discuss a range of matters related to EU exit. He was uh, by that fact. I am pretty certain the Secretary of State has been able to have a look at the petition to revoke Article 15. If he hasn't, nearly 10 per cent of his constituents have now signed it. The Scottish people just want this chaotic Tory Brexit gone. But with the UK options quickly diminishing for Scotland to remain, surely the Secretary of State of, agrees at some point the Scottish people are going to have to decide whether they want to go down with this disastrous, isolated, ugly Brexit Britain or whether they should determine their own way in Europe as an independent nation. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I, I became aware that the Honourable Gentleman did not uh, support the First Minister's policy of a people's vote when I did not see any pictures of him cuddling Alistair Campbell at the weekend. At least the Honourable Gentleman is honest. He wants to uh, revoke Article 50. I do not agree with him. That is not uh, implementing the outcome of the referendum. The best way for Scotland and the UK to proceed is to leave the EU with the Prime Minister's deal. Peter Grant. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We know that the Prime Minister yet again has had private discussions with the leader of the DUP, who is not a member of this House, does not represent any government, represents only a minority view within One Nation of these islands. When did the Prime Minister last speak to the First Minister of Scotland or of Wales? And what has the Secretary of State done to ensure that such important discussions take place during a time between now and the 12th of April? Mr Speaker, I am very surprised that the Honourable Gentleman is not aware that the First Minister of Scotland was invited to join a cabinet committee chaired by the Prime Minister to discuss Brexit preparedness, as was the First Minister of Wales. Surprisingly, the First Minister of Wales has attended. The First Minister of Scotland never has. Kirsty Blackman. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm surprised to hear the Secretary of State suggest that the best future for the people of Scotland is to leave the EU, because the UK Government's own modelling shows that any Brexit will mean that the people of Scotland are worse off as a result. Yeah. Will the Secretary of State now do his job, stand up for the people of Scotland and vote against any Brexit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm presuming that the Honourable Lady is part of the Remain elite, which Alec Neil, MSP, and Jim Sillers refer to in their letter to the Scottish Daily Mail, when they encourage all SNP MPs in this House to back the Prime Minister's deal as the best way forward for Scotland. They should listen to them. Dr Philippa Whitford. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Almost all future population growth in Scotland Scotland is predicted to come from inward migration. So a welcoming immigration policy and freedom of movement is critical for our public services and our rural communities. What discussions has he had with the Prime Minister and Home Secretary about meeting Scotland's needs or devolving the power so we can do it ourselves? Uh, well, I, I, I was Mr. Speaker, going to answer uh, that I had uh, regularly raised the issue at Cabinet until she raised the last bit about devolving uh, uh, powers, and I have been very clear uh, at this dispatch box. This government, in line with the Smith Commission, does not support the devolving of immigration. Patrick Brady. Yes, Mr. Speaker, 62 per cent of people in Scotland voted to remain, so that is an elite I am pretty happy to be part yeah. of. 
of his constituents, 14,500 of mine, have signed a petition to revoke. He is supposed to be the Secretary of State for Scotland, and yep. Scotland is against Brexit. So when is he going to do his job, yeah, stand yeah. up for Scotland, stand up to the Prime Minister, and stop Scotland being taken out of the European Union against its will? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, clearly his view isn't shared by Alec Neil MSP and the former Deputy Leader uh, of a, uh, the SNP, uh, Jim Sillers, who I know commands great respect uh, and in a, uh, Glasgow. The issue at the heart of the Honourable Gentleman's question, though, is an unwillingness to accept the outcome of the 2014 referendum. We had a United Kingdom referendum, and the United Kingdom as a whole voted to leave the EU. Rue Hendry. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will the Secretary of State join me in commending the Honourable Member for Watford for not only threatening to resign over his government's ruinous policy over Brexit, but actually having the courage, honour and conviction to follow through? Or is that an alien concept to the Secretary of State? Mr uh, Speaker, as we uh, see uh, on the SNP benches repeatedly, they want uh, to see a, a chaotic Brexit. They want uh, the chaos and disruption that no deal or no agreement uh, would bring, because they believe chaos and disruption are the best way to forward their independence referendum agenda. Mr Douglas Ross. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I'm aware that the UK Government have provided the Scottish Government with millions of pounds for uh, Brexit preparations. In the rest of the UK, that's gone to local authorities. Can the Secretary of State tell me how much money the SNP Scottish Government have given to Murray Council or any council throughout Scotland of that funding? Ah. Well, Mr Speaker, I'm sure the whole House will join me in congratulating the Honourable Member and his wife Crystal on the birth of uh, their son Alistair, and indeed commend him on using uh, the proxy voting system to reflect the views, uh, his views uh, throughout uh, his paternity uh, leave. Uh, the House may not be aware, but the UK Government uh, has provided nearly £100 million to the Scottish Government for Brexit preparations, and at the weekend the, the First Minister of Scotland was not able to identify a single penny of that that had been paid over directly to Scottish local authorities. Martin Whitfield. Thank you for Mr Speaker. Could the Secretary of State um, assist the people of Scotland by giving an indication of how he intends to vote this afternoon? Mr Speaker, uh, I am awaiting your decision on which uh, amendments will be brought forward this afternoon. Well, Blackman. Thank you, Mr Speaker. During uh, my right of friends' discussions with the Scottish Government, what preparations has the Scottish Government made for a smooth exit from the European Union and the benefits that will apply to Scotland? Uh, Mr Speaker, I would uh, uh, commend the Scottish Government for the actions which they have taken in relation to uh, preparing for uh, a no-deal uh, outcome in the, in the imminent uh, future. And indeed, uh, this was uh, acknowledged by Mike Russell, their own minister, uh, at, uh, in a TV interview at the weekend. The governments are capable uh, to uh, uh, work on that basis. But I think uh, what my honourable friend's question is getting to no, the Scottish Government have not embraced Brexit and not embraced the opportunities that it could bring to Scotland. The security. Tommy Shepherd. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, twice the elected representatives of the British people have rejected the government's withdrawal agreement, and today we move on to consider alternatives. Now, I know the Secretary of State is conflicted on this matter, but I'd like to give him the opportunity to be clear with the people of Scotland. Will he still rule out a no-deal Brexit? And if the only way to achieve that is to revoke Article 50, will he support that? I don't, uh, I don't accept the Honourable Gentleman's uh, analysis. I don't support a no-deal Brexit, and I don't support a revoking Article 50. Tommy Shepherd. Mr Speaker, I think we can only interpret from that that there are circumstances in which the Secretary of State for Scotland will consent 
to a no-deal Brexit. And in doing so, he stands against the views of the National Parliament of Scotland, of Scottish civil society and of the overwhelming majority of the Scottish people. So isn't it time now to rename his post the Secretary of State against Scotland? Mr Speaker, I'm I'm sure that line sounded better in the mirror, but I I think that clearly the Honourable Gentleman misconstrued my response. This House has made it very, very clear that it will not accept a no-deal Brexit. What, uh, however, uh, we are committed to doing is ensuring that we deliver on the referendum, and that means uh, leaving with a deal, and that's why I continue to support the Prime Minister's deal. John Lemon. Uh, question number